Incredible honour and a privilege, and I feel quite humbled every time I stand up here because God is so faithful and so amazing, and Juliet would never know, but um, she basically preached my preach again. <laughs> but it, it, it's just wonderful when God, con- how he confirms his word. And um, yeah, I'm really trusting that beyond exactly what Rich was saying there, be- that beyond the words I speak, that you would hear the Holy Spirit, and that he would bring revelation to you about everything that he wants you to step deeper into this morning. So I'm tackling a bit of a prickly subject. It's a subject of measurement. And if you're anything like me, when you hear that you're going to get measured, you get a little bit nervous because if I look at my scale, it's a bit heavier than it should be. If I look at my dress size, it's larger than I'd like. And if I look at my bank balance, it's leaner than I would like it to be. And I don't know if any of you can, maybe the media team can help me get a number up there. If any of you can recognize that number. Anyone recognize it? It's Nelson Mandela's prison number. And when he was incarcerated on um, Robben Island, he wasn't known by his name. He was assigned a prisoner number. And that's exactly the situation with prisoners. Prisoners are known by a number rather than by name. And that's exactly what the enemy would like for each one of us. He would like us to be enslaved and imprisoned by the things that we like to measure ourselves against. He'd like that to define us. But God's got a completely different take on it. And Juliet was quoting from this earlier, but in Isaiah 43 verse 1, it says, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you. He who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And I really feel that is just a confirmation of the prophetic that came earlier, that that is what God is wanting to do this morning. That, you know, the enemy is wanting to bring us to a place of condemnation and to take us back into slavery. But God loves us. And he calls us by name, and his intention is to bring conviction to us. And when he convicts us, it brings us into a life. It's always life-giving, and it produces in us incredible freedom. And so, yeah, today's um, preach I've entitled From Measure to Fullness. And towards the end of last year, I was thinking about and praying about this year, and I kept having this phrase, from measure to fullness, run through my mind. And along with it was that um, scripture from Ezekiel 47. In fact, it's the scripture that the name River Life comes from. And there's this picture um, in this vision that Ezekiel has of a river that is flowing from under the temple's threshold. It's similar to the vision that um, John has in Revelation with this um, river flowing from the throne of God. And as this river goes down its river course in Ezekiel, it gets deeper and deeper from ankle to knee to waist until this river is so deep that you can't actually stand in it. So the depth increases. And the other thing about this river that is flowing along is the fact that on the banks of the river, there are these amazing trees that bear fruit in season and out of season. The other thing about this river is that wherever it goes inside of the river, it's teeming with life. And that river for me speaks of the Spirit of God. And when we position ourselves along the banks of that river, it becomes life-giving. And I'm trusting that that's what God is going to really minister deeply into us this morning. So for the past few weeks, Paul and Rich have been speaking about the church's vision, and they've been really taking us on and had a, a clear theme and uh, about moving into maturity and growing up. And so we're kind of carrying on on that today as we carry on with this preach. So the key text for today is... Um, Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16, and I'm going to read from it now, if you can turn in your Bibles or look on the screen. So Christ himself gave the apostles, 
the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness um, of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So my first point is that outside of Christ, none of us measures up. You see, before sin came into the world, man lived in a place of honor and blessing and favor in God's glorious presence. But then sin came into the world, man was deceived, and he fell. He believed the lie of the enemy. And he no longer measured up to the standard of the holiness of God. Try as he might, and man did try, he even tried building a tower He couldn't reach up to God. He couldn't attain to that standard needed. And then God in his kindness gave the law so that man would know what the standard was that he needed to measure up to and what the sacrifice was that was required. But all that the law really did for mankind was to prove to him even further that it was impossible for him to meet this standard until God in his kindness at just the right time sent Jesus to come live the perfect life that measured up to that standard, die and be resurrected, opening up a way for each one of us by faith to receive what God had done and finally be able to measure up, not because of ourselves, but because of him. Now that's good news and that is the gospel. And my second point is that Inside of Christ, we do measure up. Jesus made a way that you and I could be justified just as if we'd never sinned. So when we receive what he's done, dying on the cross by faith, and take that for ourselves, we are now justified. The Bible calls this decision to receive Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, being born again or being saved. And if you've not done that, you may be a cultural Christian, but you're actually not what the Bible calls a Christian. You need to do that. In order to be what the Bible calls a Christian, you have to have, at some point, received Jesus personally as your Lord and your Savior. And this is when we begin to measure up. And it's got nothing to do with us. It's the grace of God. The core of our essence, our spirit, is made completely new. It's totally transformed. And we changed completely from being sinners to being saints. But at the same time, there's a little bit of a problem for us. Because our flesh what the Bible calls our flesh, that's our soul and our body, doesn't change. Not immediately. And this is where only by us surrendering to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to work in our lives, it's the Holy Spirit, and as we get more of the Holy Spirit, that we are made holy. That's how we change. So, When I got saved, there were two things that I really struggled with. I've told you, I've spoken in a bit of depth about the first one, and that was the idea that I just didn't feel like I really was accepted, didn't feel like I belonged. But the second thing that I really struggled with was this whole idea of measuring up. I really felt like I didn't measure up. 
And having started out in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, I very quickly went back to being led by my flesh. You see, I forgot those first two points very, very quickly. That firstly, outside of Christ, I don't measure up. Secondly, inside of him, I do measure up. And it's like I came to the foot of the cross and I died. And then I forgot that I died. And I started nailing some rungs onto the cross and turning it into some kind of ladder and thinking that I could somehow earn my way back up the cross. And so I'd have a quiet time. I was good. One step up the cross. I'd go to church. I'd pray. Oops, I'd fight with someone a few steps down the cross. And so we turned the cross into a ladder. Why did it? And then not only that, can you see the ladder on the other side over there? It's got a ladder on the other side. Can you see it? There are two ladders. So I look across at my friend, and I'm like, hmm. I don't know, how many of you have gone, go to a life group where the ladies bring eats? Okay, so when I go to those kind of life groups, I'm like, oh, um, my cooking's not quite at the same level as some of their cooking. I really admire their cooking. But inside of my heart, if I'm honest, sometimes when we're in those situations where we see someone who's better than us, then what do we do? We justify it and we go, oh, well, at least my children are better behaved than theirs. At least my children don't drink fizzy drinks and they don't, and I limit their screen time. Oh, why are you all laughing? <laughs> Yeah, But this is what Luke 6 verse 38 says. It says, Give and it will be given to you a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And this is speaking specifically of judgment and us passing judgment on other people. And those of you who've done some baking, you can maybe relate to this. If you're going to bake, you measure out a cup of flour, and then you're supposed to take the back of the knife and wipe it off, and there's a cup of flour. That's a correct measure of a cup of flour. But it is possible to fit more flour into that cup. So if you bang it and knock it on the side, all of the air that's inside, gets moves out, and now it drops down. And if you scoop it again, it gets even more. And if you heap it up, you've got a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We've got a very real enemy. And he's a liar, and he's up to deceiving us. And he wants to deceive us into thinking, firstly, that we don't measure up or that we, in, outside of Christ, that we can measure up. And then he wants us looking at ourselves and other people as the measure. But God wants us to function with sober judgment and a sound mind. So just to recap what I've said already. Firstly, outside of Christ, we don't measure up. Secondly, inside of Christ, we do measure up. Thirdly, Jesus is the standard that we measure our lives against. And the fourth point now is attaining to the full measure of Christ. So what is this fullness? I believe that this fullness is a territory that God wants you to inherit and to occupy. You see, the Bible speaks about fullness of joy, fullness of grace, fullness of truth, Life to the full, the God of all hope, God's abundant mercy, God's abundant blessing, God's limitless love for us, and his spirit who is without measure. The fullness of God really is the abundance of God. It's the generous portion, and it's what we inherit and receive by faithful endurance. See, in the Garden of Eden... Man was given an instruction. He was told to occupy the territory, to tend the garden, to transform the garden and increase it. But man messed up. But all the way along, God's intention 
for mankind has never changed. He's been inviting man to be in his presence and to be going deeper and deeper in intimacy with him. From the tabernacle and the tent of meeting with Moses and David to the temple with um, Solomon. And then the revelation in the New Testament that our bodies now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that us corporately as the church are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that there is God's intention for us is to be planted along that river, to occupy territory, to drink from his rivers of delight, and then to bear much fruit. We need to understand that he is giving each one of us a unique territory, a unique measure, an area to occupy. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 13, Paul speaking about that which God has called them to, says this, but we will not boast beyond limits. Now that word limits in the Greek is the word metron or measure. So you could read it, but we will not boast beyond our measure, but we'll boast only with regard to the area of influence, and again that word is the word metron or measure, that God has assigned to us to reach even you. So just like Paul, each one of us has got a limit to the area of influence and authority that we have. But we have been given a measure. We have been given an area of influence and people to have around us. But instead, what most of us do is we look over the fence at somebody else's measure and then we aren't content and we start comparing and we start competing. But that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to understand that he, what he has for us is incredibly good, that the boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places, and he wants us stepping into that area of measure. So from what we read in Ephesians 4 earlier, it started off with um, that in, uh, sorry, it, it started off with telling us that firstly, the atta- that attaining to the full measure of Christ is a corporate thing. And it spoke about the end goal being for us to all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So us becoming mature and complete, my becoming mature and complete can never be done apart from the rest of the body. And that only starts to happen when every single one of us decide corporately to step deeper into the unique spacious place that God has for each one of us. The metron, the territory, the measure that he's designed you and me individually, but yet corporately to occupy. When we do this, we begin to participate in the Father's business. We start sharing the good news of Jesus with others. We begin to extend his kingdom, leaving things and people better than we found them before. We reproduce in others ourselves and what God's put inside of us. That's called discipleship. We start exercising authority over the enemy and we start telling him to be quiet. And we begin to rule and reign in life. When we do this, we move beyond our own selfish requirements and we begin to look to the interests of the whole community. God wants us to be a mature community. He wants to enlarge our territory. He wants us to have a revelation of the fact that he is a good father and in him there is no lack. He wants us to begin to dream and to see in the spirit realm all the land that he has available for us to occupy. And when we do that, when we begin to see what he has, there's a zeal and a courage that begins to rise up inside of us. And we start to understand that 
There may be some limitations to what I can do. There may be some limitations to what the person next to me can do. But that's why doing things in family, doing things in team, doing things in community is so powerful and important. And my second point under this last thing of attaining to the full measure of Christ is this, that attaining to the full measure of Christ can never be done apart from the hand of God. In Ephesians 4.11, it says, it is Christ. That's how it starts. It is Christ who gave. You see, it's Jesus who is building his church. It's Jesus who is bringing us, his bride, to a place of maturity. Revelation 21, I'm going to read verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to skip down and read verse 15 and 16. It describes the end goal that God has in mind. It describes this bride that, that he's busy preparing. And it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. Ezekiel also has a prophetic vision of this temple that God is building. And in his vision, and you can read that in Ezekiel 40, um, he also sees an angelic being with a measuring rod. And it's quite interesting because he goes on to explain what this measuring rod is made up of. And it's made up of six long cubits. Now, in those days, a cubit was a standard measure, a unit of measurement that they used. And it was the length of a man's forearm. So from there to there. Okay. But this isn't the... That didn't, This angelic being's rod is not made up of these standard measures. It's made up of a forearm and a hand breadth. And as I was meditating on that, I was like, Lord, why forearm and a hand breadth? The forearm for me spoke to me of man's effort, our strength, our own human effort. But to it, there's added a hand breadth, the hand of God. You know, There's a difference between a a faith work and a dead work. Dead works are our human effort. A work of faith is our human effort with the hand of God added to it. There's a difference between living your life led by your flesh, your own effort, and living your life led by the Spirit of God. That's what we bring with the hand of God added to it. Zechariah 4, verse 1, and I'm going to end with this. It says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And this morning, I really believe that God is extending an invitation to us corporately to move from a measure deeper towards fullness closer towards what he has in mind for us. But it can't be done apart from the corporateness, and it can't be done apart from God himself and his hand, his Holy Spirit at work. So there have been a couple of things that we've looked at. We've said that outside of Christ, we can never measure up. You need the hand of God to be added to that. If you've never given your life over to Jesus, you don't measure up to the standard of God's requirements, and you need to allow his hand to be at work in your life. If you have surrendered to Jesus, you need to understand that you completely measure up in Christ, and you need to silence every one of the enemy's lies that are come against you. And then thirdly, the standard of measurement is Christ. And in those areas of the flesh and the body and the soul where we need to allow continued work of the Holy Spirit, 
You can't do that in your own human effort. You can't come to the foot of the cross and then start turning it into a ladder. It's got to be, Jesus, I'm here to surrender. Holy Spirit, I need more of you. You make me holy. So this morning, I'm in, I feel like the Lord is inviting us to corporately, if you're part of the body of Christ, or if you're at that place where you're like, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior, I'm inviting you to stand corporately because this journey into maturity isn't something a few of us are taking. Because if only a few of us take it, we don't get there. We all need to go on this journey. So if you're coming on the journey of saying corporately, we are committing ourselves to going deeper, then would you stand with me? And completely, this cannot be done apart from the hand of God. So I'm going to invite you to put out your hands and let's just wait. Let's not rush from this place. Holy Spirit, it's you who empowers us. Holy Spirit, it's you who makes us holy. Lord, we don't want to quench you. We don't want to grieve you. And Lord, where we've done that, we just repent right now. Lord, it's our earnest heart's desire to go deeper with you. Lord, we want to move from being in a place of measure towards fullness. Jesus, would you baptize us afresh with your Holy Spirit? Would you fall on our lives? Would you consume the dross out of our lives? Would you burn on everything that doesn't please you? Would you make us holy as you are holy? Lord, we are hungry for you.